Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Well, good morning. My name is Daniel Bennett. Um, welcome to the Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Uh, very excited to share with you all today. This message is about finding peace in the chaos. And as you know, I'm trying to break the record for fastest announcements. So very quickly, I'll say this is if you're watching this live, you can interact with us. <coughs> Excuse me. You can interact with us. You can leave uh, questions and I'll get to as many as I can at the end. If you'd like resources or prayer or to partner with us or donate anything like that, you can call our helpline at 719-635-1111. And that's open 24-7. Also, I'd like to ask a favor from you all. I'm very curious on, on the duration that you all like. And so I, I'd be interested if you leave a comment, uh, not during the chat, but afterwards, if you leave a comment in the YouTube video, I'd be curious if you could let, let me know. This is, uh, um, again, I can't guarantee we'll change something based on this, but um, would you prefer 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40? Would you prefer two hours, four hours? I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, I'd be very curious uh, to see in the comments um, what length of video is, is most convenient for you if you have a long commute and you like them to be longer or if you prefer shorter things like that But anyway, I want to talk to you all today about finding peace in the chaos and specifically So it's not just about peace in general, but specifically peace when we're surrounded by chaos and so <clears throat> Excuse me chaos can mean a lot of different things, right? There's big picture chaos uh, Matthew 24 verse 6 you know, again, we live in a dark, fallen world. Matthew 24, verse 6 says, uh, this is Jesus talking, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So in the context, he's talking about how things will get worse before the end of the world. But that's not our context. But basically, there's going to be, you know, natural disasters. There's going to be wars. There's going to be chaos, you know, in, in politics. You know, it seems like these days everyone's angry at each other. You know, there's major social division, major differences where some people call good evil and evil good, you know, and, and there's this dark against light, but then there's this chaos and anger and, um, you know, there's, you know, crime and all kinds of stuff in the world. And the thing is, it's been like that since the beginning, right? When there's very few people, you know, there's only one family on the earth, you know, Adam and Eve and their family, uh, one of their sons killed one of the other sons. I mean, there's just been, I mean, if you think about that, I don't know how many kids they had at the time. But that's like a huge percentage of the world's population being murdered by the other, right? If there's only five people or six, ten people um, and Cain kills Abel, there has been chaos ever since the fall because sin brought chaos into the world. So that's why God sent Jesus to save us from this fallen world. That's why he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. But in this world, we will have tribulation. Actually, I'll get to that verse here in just a minute. But there's, there's a big picture chaos of just society in general of weather, of climate, of um, politics, all this kind of stuff. There's also more personal uh, chaos that can be going on, right? Work situations, family situations, relationships, health, right? Where there can be chaos of, of sickness in your body or someone you care about's body. Um, chaos in finances. Um, and family, you know, maybe it's family or friends making bad decisions. Maybe it's not your relationship with them but it's you watching them helplessly from the side, watching them destroy their lives or make poor choices, things like that. So there's all kinds of different kinds of chaos. <clears throat> the main thing I mean by chaos is essentially situations or circumstances where we just feel like we have no control, right? Where things are happening that we don't want to happen. And so that's kind of the chaos is just like, I can't predict what's going to happen. I don't like it. Think all kinds of things are just going, going crazy. You know, many years ago, I was watching a movie um, about the Coast Guard. And, and I'm not going to talk about the movie, but just something that happened in the movie. One of the trainers, it, it was about the, uh, the rescue swimmers who jumped from helicopters into the water. And so it was about that. And it was one of those guys training the new people. And they said, the only difference when you're in the water, the only difference between you and the victim that you're saving, the person who needs to be rescued, is your mindset. You're in the exact same storm. You're just a person in the water. You're helpless against the storm, all that kind of stuff. They're like, you're the, the exact same situation but you're the hero and they're the person who needs to be rescued because of your different mindset. <clears throat> and that's a, that's a very interesting point that kind of stuck with me. You know, a lot of it has to do with our attitude is two people can be the, in the exact same storm and one person sees themselves as a victim and the other person sees themselves as a hero. I'm here to solve the problem. The other person's saying I need to be rescued. But the thing is that the quote isn't entirely true, true. Right. I mean, it'd be ridiculous if they were in the exact same situation. If someone jumps in the water from the Coast Guard and the person who's there struggling 
you know, the person from the Coast Guard, they have training, they have equipment, and they have support, right? So it's not just, you're not identical. One person's in, in you know, amazing athletic shape. They've been trained in what to do, what to look out for, so they're equipped mentally and in their preparation experience, their physical um, preparedness. But also they have equipment, right? They have on a wetsuit, they have on the fins, they have things to help them swim and help them breathe and um, things to help them float, you know? So they have equipment also. And then they have support, right? There's a helicopter there that can throw them a rope or people who can jump in and help out if anything goes wrong. And so it's not actually the same. But I was thinking that's actually an even better metaphor of how we are in this world. See, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And so it's not that we're in the same storm everyone else is, right? We have, we have been equipped by the word. We're, we're new creations. We're not like other people. We're not just lost in the darkness. It's like, no, we're part of a new kingdom. We've been equipped. We've been given amazing promises. We've been given, given power and we have God, right? We have Christ in us. And so it's a completely different situation. We have support that other people don't have. We have equipment, we have the training, we have all these different amazing things. So my point is that peace is partly how we think but it's also partly using the things that we've been given. We've been given things that give us an advantage that, that allow us to overcome the chaos that we're in. And so, because the world around us, it might be darkness, but that's not our situation. That's not the, li the life we're living. We're not, um, we're not of this world. We have an unfair advantage. So John 16, verse 33, um, Jesus says, "'These things I have spoken to you, "'that in me you may have peace, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So Jesus is promising, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he's saying, in me you can have peace. But he didn't say, oh, and there's going to be no problems in the world. Say, no, in me you have peace. The world, you're going to have tribulation. The world's a mess. It's someday going to be destroyed, literally. And, and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. But he's saying, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. See, this is a dark world, but Jesus overcame it, and he's inside of you. If you're born again, he's inside of you. And so your peace isn't just hope. It's not just your attitude. It's that the overcomer is actually inside of you. So it's not just a philosophy. It's not just sitting back saying, I accept the storm. I accept what's going to happen. Or even just the bad doctrine that God's in control of everything. God's not in control of everything. Sin entered the world. <clears throat> Different story. But right, why would Jesus say to pray, thy will be done on heaven as it is on earth, if it was already happening? God's will is not happening perfectly on this earth. It's full of darkness. That's why we needed a savior. So we can be of good cheer because the overcomer is inside of us. We're in a dark world, but the, the one inside of us is greater. First John 4, 4, um, another scripture on this. First John 4, 4 says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So we don't even need to be scared of the devil. The one who's in us is greater than he who's in the world. So Satan became the god of this earth at the fall because Adam submitted his authority to the devil. So Satan became the god of this earth. So he has influence and authority over this world. It's a different topic. But Christ has overcome him. So now we have the overcomer inside of us. So my first and, and main point, basically oh, my, my only point really, but I'll be breaking this down from a few different angles, is that the secret to having peace in the chaos is to look to Jesus, but don't only look to him as your rescuer, look to him because he's who's inside of you. Look to him to see who you are in this world now, right? You're a new creation, your identity's been changed. So look to Jesus and say, he's my rescuer, but also look to him and say, wow, I can do what he can do. He's in me. I have the same power in this world that he has. <clears throat> so don't look to him purely for salvation. He saved you by making you like him, by, become, by, by coming inside of you, by making you a being in his image. And so you can look to him as a role model, not just a savior, if that makes sense. He saves us by making us his brothers and sisters, right? We're, we're his brethren. So let me show Peter walking on water here to give an example of this. So Matthew 14, verse 29 says, um, Jesus said, this is when Jesus is walking on water. Um, it says, uh, Sorry, Jesus said to him, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. And people give Peter a hard time, but he walked on water. He did something no one, no one else had done um, other than Jesus. Verse 30, but when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
See, this is a great example of this, is that the storm was happening all along. When Jesus, the storm didn't start halfway through Peter walking on water. When Peter got out of the boat and started walking, there was a storm, but he didn't notice it. He was so focused on Jesus that he forgot there was a storm. So he's focused on Jesus and starts walking on water. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he, got, he must have gotten pretty far because it says that Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him when he started sinking. And so it's not like he just stepped out of the boat, took two steps and sank. He got close to Jesus. So he's walking on water successfully in spite of the storm. But the minute he became focused on the storm, he sank because he lost his faith, right? I'm not looking at Jesus. I'm looking at my circumstances. And now I'm afraid. But as long as he was looking to Jesus, he was fine. So that is the first key is look to Jesus. And so when there's a storm and you say, hey, I'm looking at you, Jesus, and I'm focused on you and who you are and what you've promised me and who you are in me. And, um, and no, those things, they're still there, but you don't notice them and they don't have the effect on you, right? You're doing the impossible. I'm walking on water. It's impossible to walk on water, but Jesus is greater than the impossible. He, he's, he's the creator of the world. He can overcome, right? It's supernatural power that does things that are impossible in the natural. So, Peter walked through a storm. He's, he's walking on water in the midst of chaos, but looking to Jesus was the secret. He wasn't looking at the storm. So again, the first part is look to Jesus and you won't sink. But the second part is of this, if you do mess up and sink, look to Jesus to rescue you. That's perfectly valid, right? If you're, if you're stuck in the storm, I don't know if you've ever had this happen. Like if you've ever played in the ocean, uh, you know, and sometimes you get hit by a big wave. At least this has happened to me. Or if you get hit by a big wave, maybe you got a little bit farther than you expected. <laughs> and you get hit by a wave and suddenly you're kind of just caught up in it and you're tumbling around and you're like, I don't know which way's up and which way's down. Um, you know, I'm kind of just caught up in this wave and I need to get back to the surface before the next wave hits me. It can feel very helpless because, again, it looks like water. Oh, fun water. I'm going to play in it. The minute you get stuck in it, you're like, oh, wow, the ocean's huge. I feel completely powerless against this. And sometimes life circumstances can feel that way, where you're like, I don't know how to save myself. I need help. And that's the thing, is that if you need help, if you're, if you're, if you're being destroyed by the storm, look to Jesus, right? Peter said, Jesus, save me. Jesus saved him. He, he looked to Jesus. So it's okay if we're failing, if we fell and messed up and we're just being you know, consumed by the storm, then now, that's not the time to say, I'm going to do this on my own. That's time to say, Jesus, save me. Right? So look to Jesus to rescue you if you're caught up in it. <clears throat> but we can, we can strive for more than that. Jesus didn't say, I'm, I'm here to always rescue you, and you're here always to be a victim. It's, no, I'm here to rescue you when you need that. But ideally, you look to me and say, I can be like you. Again, we're disciples of Jesus. We should be the ones walking on water, lifting other people out of it. Because, again, we're, we're called to be like him, not just to be rescued by him. So Isaiah 26, verse 3 reinforces this. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Right? God will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind on him. Right? So, again, as long as you're focused on Jesus, you can walk on water. As long as you're focused on God, he will give you perfect peace because you're focused on him. And, and so, you, again, you have peace that passes understanding. It's like, I don't understand the storm but I do understand you and I understand who you are and what you've done and that I'm safe with you. Um, Proverbs 18, verse 10, <clears throat> excuse me, says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Again, sometimes we get sucker punched. Sometimes it's like, hey, I know this shouldn't be happening. I know the thief has no right to steal, kill and destroy my life right now. But thieves do things they're not supposed to, right? So he got away with it. I, I should have resisted him. I messed up. I don't know how this happened, whatever. Sometimes we get sucker punched by the world, even though we shouldn't be, right? We have the promises to be protected, but for some reason, something gets through. Well, when that happens, run back to Jesus, right? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. You know, a strong tower is, right? You might be out in the field and you see enemies approaching and you run away. Right? You protect me. I'm not going to protect myself. You protect me. I just need you. So the righteous run to it and are safe. We run to Jesus and we're safe in him. So don't ever be afraid or ashamed to say, Jesus, save me. But again, my point is, ideally, though, we're becoming like him because he's inside of us. And so we're walking on water and we're helping the ones who still aren't strong in the Lord yet. We're helping lift them out of the water who are sinking in life circumstances. So, yeah, if you're ever overwhelmed, look to Jesus. But when you're not overwhelmed, look to Jesus. You should always be looking to Jesus. I think Pastor Rick has a quote on that. Um, 
So anyway, if you truly want to walk, to vic- walk in victory, don't just see him as your rescuer. See him as someone who's in you. He's in me. I can do what he does. I can live in the same victory he does, right? You should be looking at Jesus on the water and say, I can be like you because you're in me. It's not my own strength, my own righteousness, none of that. I can be like you because that's who you've made me. And so we should be inspired by him, not just um, ask him to help us. And the thing is that he gives us power. So that's the key. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is 2 Timothy 1.7. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. <clears throat> See, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but he did give us a spirit of power and a spirit of love and a sound mind. And, and to me, I used to always focus on the love part of that. He didn't give me a spirit of fear. He gave me a spirit of love. But one day God really quickened it to me. He gave me a spirit of power. I should be walking in this life saying, there's power in me, ready to overflow, ready to change my circumstances. And so one of the keys to having peace in chaos is to walk in a spirit of power. So again, it's not just peace in your emotions, but peace in your, you know, I want to actually change the circumstances around me, right? See, Jesus, when he wanted to, he could calm a storm. Right? He's like, I don't need to calm this because I'm walking on water. I don't, it doesn't bother me. Oh, wait, it's bothering them. Okay, I'm going to calm this storm. And so, you know, having power changes how you approach life. If you're like, oh, no, I can get the results that I want. And that's, that's my quick definition of power is the ability to get results. Right? If you think about power and how people use the word power, right, someone might say a president is powerful. What's that mean? It means they can get results. They can make things happen in their country. They can make things happen in relationships with other countries. They have a lot of power <clears throat> um, of a certain sort. A wealthy person is, is called powerful. Wow, they're so powerful because they can hire people. They can buy things. They can do things other people can't do. They can get results other people can't get because they can use their wealth. But you can say a singer is very powerful. Right? Wow, that person really moved me. That song you know, made an impact on me. Because, so they're getting results. They wanted to affect your emotions, and they did. That's power. Um, electricity is literally called power because it allows you to use things, right? It allows you to get results. I have this vacuum cleaner. If I have power, if I plug it in, I can use it. I get results. If I don't have power, then it's just a, a, a piece of metal sitting right there, plastic, whatever. And so power is the ability to get results. <clears throat> and that's the thing I want to focus on specifically is that there's the emotional side of peace, but it shouldn't stop with our emotions. We should have peace because we go around with the spirit of power saying, I can do something about these problems. <clears throat> he who's in me is greater. I can actually calm down this storm. If, if different circumstances are going wrong, things like that, I can do something about this. We aren't just victims getting beat up by the circumstances around us, right? God's given us a spirit of power and we can change the circumstances around us, right? It's not just about saying, well, I'm sick, and I have all these health issues and now I have peace about it, okay? But true peace in your body is not just having peace in your emotions. It's like, no, peace in my body means health. Peace is much bigger than we realize. It's not just emotions. Peace is about all kinds of peace. It's about having peace in your circumstances, peace in your finances, peace in your body, peace in your mind, peace in your relationships, all kinds of things. So don't settle just for emotional peace. We want to, to let the peace overflow in us and cause peace around us. You know, John 9, verse 5, Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Right? So when he was on the earth in his physical body, he was the light of the world. But now that he's in heaven and he's in us, now we're the light of the world. So we're Jesus in this world. So we're the light of this world. So we don't just sit around saying, my goodness, all the darkness. It's, no, we're the light. We're the solution to this problem. <clears throat> the world is full of darkness. The thing is, if you're born again, you don't need to be rescued. You've already been rescued. Now we're the heroes. Now we're the ones who are the light of this world, helping rescue other people. We're the light. So we've been rescued. If we ever fall down and get stuck in a mess, we can be re-rescued in that sense. I'm not talking salvation, but just in that mess. And so again, we should be going around with that spirit of power and and where we say, oh yeah, there's chaos. Uh, Cool. I want to go help. I'm not scared by chaos. I run to chaos because I want to be part of the solution. You know, Mark 16, starting in verse 16, Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is a power scripture. Right? This is talking about, it's not saying those who believe in me 
will have emotional peace even though bad things happen all around them. That's saying those who, those who believe in me will go around and bad things won't have power over them, right? So take up serpents and drink de anything deadly. It won't hurt you. So you have power in the sense of like, I, I'm healthy because of who, what Jesus did, not because of what people are doing to me. But also casting out demons, speaking with other tongues, you know, laying hands on the sick and re having them recover. <clears throat> this is about going around being light. So it's not just about emotional peace. It's about saying, I have peace because I have so, there's so much peace inside of me. I can create peace around me. I can bring peace into someone else's body through healing. I can bring peace to someone else's soul through deliverance, you know, whatever it may be. So we're the solution from the chaos. We're not running from it. We're not just believing a philosophy, you know, changing our mindset. Again, that's important to change how we think, but it doesn't stop there. It should change the, the, the power should flow through us and do something about the, the problems around us. So, you know, a quick example, right? If your floor is dirty and you have the best vacuum cleaner in the world and it's plugged in, right? So if the floor is dirty, step one, is don't get overwhelmed, don't panic, don't cry, right? Have that emotional peace and say, I'm fine, I'm here as an overcomer, right? So again, emotional stuff is great. But, but really, you want to say, well, I have this vacuum cleaner. How about I just create peace around me? I'm going to use what I've been equipped with to, to solve the problems around me. And so, <clears throat> again, don't be discouraged, don't panic, look to Jesus for that emotional, mental peace, but then step back and say, well, all his promises are yes and amen. He who's in me is greater than he who's in the world. I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to turn on my vacuum cleaner. I'm going to clean up this mess. Instead of just having peace about the mess, I'm going to solve the mess. So use the vacuum cleaner. You know, peace is not just about our emotions. It's about our bodies. It's about our finances. It's about our, our, our health, our circumstances, our relationships, the people we care about. We can do something about it. <clears throat> so the, next, the last question I'll end with is, how do we know what to do? Okay, so I know that I can be part of the solution, but how do I know what to do? And this is where we need God to lead us, right? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. And you probably know the scripture. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. You don't have to figure everything out on your own. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. All right, so if we trust God, and we look to Him for direction, He will guide our steps. He will lead us in what to do. It's like, okay, I have a spirit of power, but what do I do, Lord? Because even Jesus said, I don't do anything that the Father hasn't shown me. So it's not about us just coming up with wild things and assuming, like, oh, I'm just going to um, jump into that mess and jump into that storm and do all these things by my own, um, um, you know, my own ideas. It's, no, it's what's God leading me to do in this situation? He'll give us direction. Um, James 1.5 is a similar scripture in the New Testament. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Then it goes on to say, but ask in faith. <clears throat> but if you lack wisdom, if you don't know what to do, right? Wisdom is about knowing what to do in a situation, knowing what to do to solve a problem, you know, whatever it may be. If you lack wisdom, ask God, right? So in Proverbs, we see lean on God's understanding, not your own. And here we see ask God for wisdom. So again, we need to ask God, what should I do in this situation? So again, first we get that emotional piece of, okay, I can hear you clearly because I'm not stressed out, I'm not panicking, I'm not afraid, I'm not looking at the storm, I'm looking at Jesus. Now that I'm looking at Jesus, Lord, what should I do? What would you like me to do in this situation? It's much easier to hear God when you have peace in your heart. Because now you're not looking at the storm, because if, again, if you're looking at the storm and Jesus is trying to give you direction and you're like, I can't hear you, Lord, I'm just looking at the chaos around me, it's going to be very hard to hear him. But if you're looking at him, and you've t tuned out all the other stuff, and you're like, oh, that's simple. You want me to do this? I'll do it. Sounds good. So it's easier to hear what God is leading us to do when we have peace in our hearts. Uh, the last scripture I'll, I'll look at here is Colossians 3, verse 14. Colossians 3, 14 says, But above all these, be, above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. So let God's peace rule in your heart, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, and it goes on. But I'll stop there. So he's saying, let the peace of God rule in your heart, and let the word of God dwell in you richly. Again, we can't do any of this without the word. God's word is how he equips us and how he empowers us. And so God's word feeds us, strengthens us. It's how we look to Jesus. And so we are letting God's word dwell in us richly. It's just overflowing inside of us. 
and we're letting God's peace rule in our hearts. So it's like, no, this is, God's peace is in charge of my heart, not my circumstances, not that relationship, not that person. That person doesn't like me. That doesn't control my peace. God controls my peace. Right? Who cares if other people like me if God likes me? Right? So you sure, I want other people to like me, but if he, as long as he likes me, I'm fine. Right? And saying God's peace rules in my heart. Christ's word is dwelling richly inside of me. And so we're walking in this perfect peace, and, uh, and that gives God the ability to give us direction. We're walking in thankfulness and joy, and we're blessing other people. So <clears throat> we can't control what's, uh, what's happening around us, but we can control what's happening inside of us. That's up to us. We get to decide, are we looking to the spirit or looking to the flesh? So again, we can't control everything around us, but with wisdom, with direction from God, with God's power inside of us, we can make an impact, right? So we can't control everything in this world. But we are the light of this world, so we can overcome things in this world. We follow God's direction in that. And so the way that we find peace in, in the chaos is looking to Jesus and getting direction from Him, realizing that we're the solution, that we can, we can calm down the chaos. We can find areas of, of light that it's like, I'm going to bring light and victory into this situation and in that situation. And so even though I can't control the whole world and make everybody do what I think they should do, He who's in me is an overcomer, right? He who's in me is greater than He who's in the world. So. I, I hope this helps. Um, I look forward to getting to your questions. And uh, yeah, we have a little bit extra time for Q&A, or I might just end early. If you guys have good questions, I'll go long. If you have really lame questions, I'll wrap this thing up. So anyway, hope this was a blessing, and we'll move on to the questions now. So, <clears throat> and as always, I give the disclaimer, I haven't vetted these at all, so I don't know if I have an answer when I start reading the question. Um, Denise on YouTube says, what are some ways to make our initial instinct or habit to look unto Jesus if issues arise um, so that we can be strong water walkers as opposed to being the ones that need saving. So what are some ways to, to change our initial instinct? I would say part of this is practice, is that when you mess up, say, oops, I messed up. I'll fix it now, right? Repent quickly. The quicker you repent, right? Instead of saying, oh, I messed up. I might as well wallow in this for a long time. Okay, you're training yourself in the wrong way. <clears throat> so what I found in, in my life is the more quickly I repent, and by repent, I don't mean feel bad, I mean turn around. Oops, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction, I'm going to change directions. The, the quicker you do that, the more quickly you realize it's not worth it to make the mistake because I know I'm going to have to repent anyway. Right? If someone says, <clears throat> I need you to walk this way, and you start walking that way, if you repent, you have to walk longer. Right? I walked this way, ugh, great, now I have to walk even farther to get there. And so the more you repent, the more you ch are training yourself you know what, that's a waste of time. I'm just wasting time and emotions and energy by going this way. I'm just going to go this way the first time. So we just train ourselves, repetition, repetition. You know, I mean, think how people do things in the military and stuff like that, right? It's like, you know, they're like, we need to train your, your instincts. We need your muscle memory to change. And so we have to just practice, 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 so that when something happens for real, that's ingrained in you. <clears throat> and so it's just practice, keep doing it and get, get better and faster every time you mess up. I mean, this happens all the time. Oops, I could have done that better. Okay, I, I did good, but I could have done it. I could have walked in more victory. I could have turned to Jesus more quickly. And so again, it's a, ma a matter of repenting, not condemning yourself. See, the trap is some people say, I messed up and now I need to feel bad. I need to beat myself up. I need to repent, apologize, apologize. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not helpful. That's what the accuser is trying to do, accusing you and accusing you and accusing you. That's not helpful. Quickly repenting and humbly receiving forgiveness if it's something that, that needs forgiveness. Um, but just humbly saying like, oh, Lord, I, I was going the wrong direction. I'm going the right direction now. And I humbly accept your grace. Move on. It's so much better to do that. You can imagine you're teaching a child how to color. And then they draw outside the line. And they just start crying. And they're inconsolable, right? They just cry for hours and hours and hours and hours. You're like, well, it's going to be hard to get better at this. If you cry that much, every time you mess up, just try again. It's okay. And that's not even the best example because um, if they want to color outside the lines, who cares, right? They let them be creative. But if they're trying to color in the lines and they want to give up, um, just, just try again. Just um, go for it. So uh, let's see here. Um, let's see. So... Um, Lara, or Lara, uh, on chat, says, Daniel, how do we get a revelation of God's power? I understand His grace and kindness very well, but I need to understand His supreme power and strength in my life. Great question. 
And like I, like I ended with there, it's letting the words of Christ dwell in us richly. So the way we get all revelation is by God's word dwelling in us. So, so spending time, I mean, I would say spend more time. You, you've probably spent time, you know, if you have a strong revelation of God's kindness and his grace, you probably spent time meditating on that. Conversations with God, looking at scriptures on this, listening to teachings on this, meditating on it, having experiences where you saw God being faithful in those areas, maybe turning to him when you needed his tender side and just seeing like, wow, he's so kind and compassionate and encouraging. And so you, the way you get strong in that is that you have the word sown in you and then you walk it out. So you start, start living this and getting experiences and building momentum. And next thing you know, you're like, I'm unshakable in this area. Same thing with power. So you spend time meditating on God's word. You look at examples of miracles. You, you daydream about it, right? You say, you know, you read a story about somebody and you're like, what would I do in that situation? You know, and, and you visualize, what if I did what they did? What would it take inside of me for me to be like the woman who touched the hem of his garment? What would it take for me to be like Peter jumping out of the boat? Like true, don't just say, oh, Peter jumped out of the boat and walked on water. No, picture yourself. You know, again, I'm just talking about meditating on what you're reading. So don't just read the word, but think about it. And so you're saying, so really spend time chewing on examples of power in the word. Say, okay, if I were in a boat for real and it's cold and it's windy and it's stormy and it's dark and I'm scared for my life and I see Jesus there, what would it take inside of me for me to step out of the boat? What revelation? Okay, God, what is it that I'm not seeing that he saw? I want to see it too. And so you just spend time having these conversations with God and then you just have the practice. You know, you just start um, following God when he gives you direction and you see the results and that reinforces it. Now you have testimonies to look back on. You remind yourself of past victories, things like that. So same as any revelation getting stronger, you make your heart more sensitive to it by considering it. So actually that's a, um, which one is that? Hardness of heart is a great message by Andrew or series by Andrew. We make our hearts more sensitive to God by what we focus on and consider. We harden our hearts to what we don't consider. And so we want to use that in both ways. We want to make our heart more sensitive to God's power and considering how powerful he is in us. We want to harden our hearts to um, powerlessness and things like that. So I'd encourage you, if, if you're more interested in, in, a, in more context on that, to look up that series. Um, but yeah, hope that's helpful. And again, so, so it's a matter of sowing the word, walking it out, having conversations, seeing, seeing results, um, being thankful for them, reminding yourself of them, and on and on in a cycle. <clears throat> um, so, uh, UP um, shut on YouTube. So I was wondering if it was up or UP. Um, but how can I be sure I have the right peace? The enemy can lull us to sleep as well. Um, uh, the enemy can lull us to sleep as well after all, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so when I'm talking about peace, I'm not talking about being passive. So peace is, is a spiritual, true peace is a spiritual thing that affects our emotions, affects our body, affects our minds, affects our circumstances, the whole deal. When I talk about peace, I'm not talking about passivity, of just sitting back and saying, oh, I just have peace about all these chaotic things happening. That's kind of the exact opposite of what I'm getting at, is that true peace is that we're the light of this world and that's, it's actively destroying darkness around us. So true peace is not just contentment, because it's easy to sit back and say, I have no food, and I'm fine with that. I'm just going to sit here because I'd rather not work. You know, that's not peace. That's laziness. That's giving into carnality because it's giving our flesh what it wants. My flesh, the voice of laziness is stronger than the voice of hunger. And so I'm going to do what my flesh wants. So, you know, and, and that's, I'm not saying just about that, just a metaphor in general. And so I'm not talking about just saying, well, look what's happening in the world. Look what's happening in my family. I have peace about it. I'm okay with it. Peace does not mean being okay with something. Peace means it won't get inside of me and I can affect it. This will not change who I am and how I think and how I live life with God, but I can do something about it. So it's a great point to make. I mean, it's a question, but it's also a great, great um, a point to mention here that you're bringing up is that we don't want to be lulled to sleep because when we think of peace, we just think of taking a nap. Um, again, that's a great metaphor. And, and sometimes that may be the accurate case, right? Jesus is asleep in the storm. That's because he had power over it. You know, he could have calmed it at any moment, and he did when he wanted to. So, yeah, it's not about doing nothing. All right. So, read on chat, how do we resist those in turmoil coming against those in peace? Um, so, same thing, right? So, in this world, you will have tribulation. In this world, we'll have persecution. Well, you know, we're surrounded, part of darkness, it's not just weather and, you know, um, politics, <clears throat> it's that there's people, you know, we're surrounded by people. We're living in a world full of selfish people. 
And our flesh is also selfish. So it's not even like all Christians are perfect and all non-Christians aren't. It's that just by everybody's flesh is selfish and self-centered and only sees a limited perspective and has, you know, different philosophies and how they approach life. So we're just surrounded by this. Now we have the overcomer inside of us. Many Christians um, don't walk in it much. And I'd say no Christians walk in it perfectly 24 <clears> seven. And so, <clears throat> um, but again, that's the whole point to this is that if we have peace inside of us, we don't have to let their turmoil get to us, right? Even if they're constantly trying to get us to worry or they're constantly trying to stress us out um, or th their life is just chaos and they try to bring you into their drama. And, and I mean, sometimes it could even be a situation of boundaries where it's like, listen, if I can't affect you in a positive way, then I need to follow this boundary because I can't let you affect me in this negative way. <clears throat> an, an example that Billy Epperhart uses a lot, he says, if you sit on a block of ice, <clears throat> if you start to melt it, you can stay there. But if it starts to freeze you, you need to get up and leave. And basically, meaning in relationships, if you have a relationship where they're having a bigger impact on you than you're having on them, then you need to get out of that relationship if it's a negative one. But if you're being a good influence on them, right? If they're in chaos and you're peace, and when they spend time with you, peace wins, then maybe that's a, a relationship where you're sowing into them and you're blessing them. But if their chaos is starting to bring you into chaos, then maybe you need better boundaries. Um, maybe it's because you're not strong enough in a certain area, or maybe they just are refusing to change. You can't force someone else to change. They have free will. And so at some point, it's like, if that's what you're choosing, then, then I choose to, to live my life like this, and I can't let you just be in my life. I mean, sometimes, I mean, boundaries is a different topic, but it's huge. I've seen some people, in the name of being good Christians, bring someone into their life that now is being a terrible influence on their family. It's like, well, I need to love this person. And so even though they're harming my children or even though they're a bad influence on whatever else, but I need to love them like Christ. And it's like, no, you have a responsibility to protect, protect the people you have responsibility over, but also protect your own heart. God did not call you to always um, allow every single person to have close relationship with you in a way that can have a negative effect. And so um, how do we resist them? That's again, and say our peace can overcome their turmoil, but sometimes there's a boundary of if they're refusing what I have to offer, then, then I can't have this relationship, at least not to that same degree. Um, let's see. Emmanuel on Facebook says, grace and peace is usually used in scriptures, but I don't really understand how to distinguish between them. I just believe that peace is a major part of grace. Is there any distinction? So yes and no, because ultimately they're both aspects of Jesus, right? All true gifts from God are in Jesus, right? Health, life, peace, joy, grace, faith, everything. We received Jesus, we received all of it. So in a sense, they're the same thing because they're both parts of Jesus. But there, are, there is a distinction there, right? Where peace is a bit more about, um, you know, the absence of negative things. You know, so peace, there's a calmness. So other good things can happen, but peace is kind of just like a, a, a blank slate of negative things not happening so that you can have control over the good things that are there. Um, I'd say just across the board, right? If you have peace in your body, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're athletic. It just means that you don't have sickness. If you have peace in your finances, it just means that you have enough. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have abundance. And so peace mostly means the absence of bad things. And so that you have this clean slate to where you and God can start building things that you want to build and, and planting and reaping things that you want to plant and reap. Grace is much bigger. I mean, there, there's so many messages on grace, but grace is, is um, you know, God's unconditional favor, God's power. It's, it's, how, it's basically God giving to us, right? It says God gives grace to the humble, or basically grace is what God gives to us, and humility is how we receive it. Humility is receiving God's gifts for us. And so, so grace is kind of how God gives everything. Um, but truly, ultimately, you can't get one without the other, you know, because... God's grace includes peace, and you only get p true peace from grace. And so, uh, yes and no. My favorite kind of answer. Uh, all of the above. So anyway, I think, well, I'll, I'll end with this last one, and then I think we'll wrap up a bit early. So Valsa on YouTube says, how do you recognize the voice of the Lord when he speaks? <clears throat> and this is a much bigger topic. Um, I, I'll, I'll mention, so I have a message on here, and I'm sure others do also, but one I did a while ago called The Key to Everything. It was about how to hear God's voice. I have another one um, called How to Hear God More Clearly, <clears throat> things like that. Um, but basically, it's you, you know him, right? If you, if you want to recognize someone's voice, right? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So, so it sounds like you know that, right? We do hear his voice. 
The question is, how do we recognize his voice? And the way we recognize his voice is by knowing him. We know him through his word. That's where he perfectly reveals himself. And so we sow the word into our hearts. We, we start to know what he's like, how he thinks. Now, it's not just, <clears throat> um, we need to rightly divide the word. So if you just start reading some random prophet in the Old Testament and you don't understand the context, then you might get the wrong image of God because that's under a different covenant, under a specific time and season. <clears throat> so we need to rightly divide the word. But if we understand who God is, what he's like, you know, um, so I'd recommend like the war is over, true nature of God, some, some of Andrew's messages like that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but if you know who God is, what he's like, if you know who you are, the new covenant, what Jesus has accomplished, who he is in you. So if you understand those things and you spend time in the word, growing and growing, learning, uh, now, now the Holy Spirit can, can bring those things to your remembrance. But also when you hear your voice, be like, that sounds like Jesus. I recognize that voice. That's him. And if you hear something else, right, if you hear, I'm angry at you and you're a disappointment and I'll never love you. You're like, God, is that you? No, if you know the word, you'll never think that that was God's voice. So, but some people think that. They're like, oh my goodness, this must be God because I feel so guilty. And that's not the fruit of how God speaks to us. And so if we know the word, the Holy Spirit can bring it to our remembrance. And that's one way of hearing God. Another way is that when we hear God, we can quickly con compare it to the word and see if it sounds like God, if it's, if it's scriptural or not. Um, there's many other ways. I'm actually here at Karis. I'm about to teach a whole eight-hour course on, on um, um, how to hear God's voice more clearly. And so, so there's a lot more that could be said, but I'll just end with that is we, we learn to recognize him through his word. He'll never go against his word because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his word is alive. And so spending time in the word, getting to know him, what he's like. Again, like I'd say, true nature of God is very helpful because you get to know what he's like and what he's interested in. Um, and that helps us discern, um, is this voice from God or not from God? And spending time, I'd also say just spending time listening, right? When we pray, many times we think of prayer as talking to God, but it can be a conversation. It can be talking with God, taking time to listen, taking time to be silent and to see what he's stirring in our hearts and um, things like that. So, um, yeah, we could go on and on. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up now just a few minutes early because I'm curious. Also, don't forget, uh, I'm curious if you could leave in the comments um, what kind of duration would be your favorite? Do you prefer 30 minutes? five hours, like marathon fewer, <laughs> um, you know, 50 minutes, 40, whatever it may be. I'm, I'm just curious about that. But anyway, hope you have a blessed weekend. It was great having an opportunity to share with you. Um, yeah, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. I'd like to give you a special invitation to join me on March the 7th through the 9th for our men's advance. We're going to have Jeremy Pearson speaking. He's a powerful minister and also Todd White. And then we'll also have myself and some of our staff here. And we've been doing these men's advances for over a decade, and we have seen people's lives changed. I would really encourage you, especially you ladies, send your husbands, send your kids. We've seen people's lives changed, and I promise you it'd be a blessing. So check it out. March the 7th through the 9th, our men's advance in Woodland Park, Colorado. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.